Hi, everybody. So, uh, if I'm just going to assume everybody seeing this is coming to my channel for the first time. Uh, hello, my name's Alex. I'm a graduate student. I am uh, a mathematician. I'm finishing up a PhD in math, and my field of research is what you see right here, computability theory. And as it stands, this the, the month is September. It's the year 2020. Everybody's stuck inside, and I didn't get a chance to teach this semester. And... Um, so in the absence of teaching, I feel I, I still have that hunger to explain math to people. And so I figured this might be a good time in my life for me to start to run through my own research notes, sort of. These aren't really my research notes. These are more um, just kind of uh, stuff I've explained to myself. Um, that's how I learn. I learn by explaining things to myself. That's just how I learn personally. I learn by explaining things to myself. and. Uh, I have nobody to explain things to this semester, so I figured this would be a good time to explain the things that I've learned about computability theory uh, to YouTube, in case that's not there. I assume that there's a lot of good uh, computability theory videos already on YouTube, um, but I figure maybe I'll just kind of go through a class, because there's definitely some things in these notes that, um, honestly, maybe I'm the only one that's done them recently, or at all. So uh, there's a lot of little details that I got stuck on, and... Um, I don't know. Um, I, I've been wanting to do this for a long time, and the reason I haven't has, is mostly because I'm a perfectionist. Well, that's one, th one of the reasons. Um, and so to get past that, I'm just kind of forcing myself to jump in and wing it. And then secondarily, um, and this is the bigger issue, is, um, you know, computability theory is a bit of a, you know, it's a high level field of math. It's a field that it's something that a lot of people will probably want to learn, regardless of how much math they know. And technically, it doesn't have any prerequisites. It's not like you need calculus to learn computability theory or anything like that. Um, but um, it still requires a certain level of mathematical maturity, probably, um, depending on how good I am of a teacher. Uh, it probably depends on it. It, it, it it's going to assume a certain level of understanding of, of formal logic and set theory and and you know in order to get people truly ready to uh go through a set of lectures on youtube about computability theory there would be a lot of stuff that i would have to go through ahead of time we would probably have to go through some stuff on proof writing we would probably have to go through some of the basics of formal logic and set theory um and the reason i never made these videos is because i never really wanted to do that that part always sounded boring to me i wanted to explain computability theory so in the in the uh uh, in the interest of just kind of going for it, I am going to assume that uh, you've seen a lot of that. Um, not all of it, um, but um, a good amount of it. It's going to be basically a situation where I think from watching my videos, you're going to walk away feeling maybe like you need to go look uh, for more information kind of on the prerequisites. But we'll see how it goes. I really have, this is extremely experimental. I'm just kind of going for it. Uh, but, you know, this is a... This is an advanced kind of topic, and it's it's going to take some nuance in its approach. And but I, I do think that I'll be able to exp I, I'll be, I do think that I'll be able to present something that everybody will get something out of. So uh, with that said, what I want to do before jumping into computability theory, or even talking about what computability theory is, or I mean, I guess in the interest of that, uh, I want to uh, talk a little bit about just math in general and what math is to me. Uh, what math is in general, what I think, what the way that I look at math, the way that I look at science and philosophy. So uh, basically, what I think, what I look at math as, is I look at it as a process of, of, of doing the following things. So I'm going to actually, I actually started out with this nice quote here that you probably read. Uh, this is one of my favorite quotes of all time by one of the greatest scientists of all time, Karl Marx, who wrote, uh, there is no royal road to science. And only those who do not dread the fatiguing climb of its steep paths have a chance of gaining its luminous summits. Uh, basically, if you really want to understand something, whatever that thing is, uh, there's no shortcuts. You just kind of got to wade through it. And once you get through it, there is going to have been things that you realize you could have done differently to learn it faster. You know, there's going to be a lot of situations where you rack your head against something that seems so simple that you wasted weeks on, and everybody goes through that. That is how you learn. So I'm, gonna, I'm gonna actually type some things out and arrange them. I think that's what I'm gonna do because a lot of the initial stuff I wanna talk about uh, will be kind of wordy and not mathy. So uh, what I wanna kind of lay out is, in my opinion, 
uh, what math is all about. And again, I'm not, I'm a mathematician. I'm not a well-versed sci uh, scientific philosopher, but I do have some ideas. And um, one of the things that I'd like to do through these YouTube videos is sort of teach myself um, through, ex through explanation, through talking to myself. So, you know, if you know more about some of this philosophical stuff than I do, uh, please chime in. But to me, I'm, I'm gonna give my sort of input on, on this. So to me, the process, math, the process of developing mathematical theory um, involves the following. I'm going to put it out in steps. So the first step is this. I have something that I want to uh, understand better, some concept that I want to understand better. Say, so pick an informal concept that you want to better understand. That's step one, I guess. I'm not going to label these numbers, but that, that, that is kind of the first, the starting point. Where, pick, a, pick an informal concept that you want to better understand. What do I mean by inf informal concept? Well, I mean that there's a lot of abstraction in life that you just kind of, I don't know, I don't know. Maybe you just pick up on it. Maybe somebody alerts you to it. I'm not really sure it matters. But there are abstractions that you will become aware of in your late in your life as a human um, that do require some exploration in order to understand better, in order to use. So, for example, one example of one of these informal concepts might be quantity. This is the, probably the first one that everybody learns about. Quantity, the idea of numbers of things. You know, you you start to pick up on this maybe in kindergarten, right? There, you know, I can count. The concept of being able to count, the concept of these things called numbers that can help you think. But in order to get a better idea of how to think, you've got to understand quantity. Um, and you've got, to, you've got to pick up on certain like properties of that before you can really start to learn, right? By the time you were learning about addition, you had already sort of picked up on this idea of addition. You were just formalizing it at that point. So, I mean, quantity is a very basic, very primal one. Another one is probability. Right. If you've ever said the word probably in your life, uh, then there's there's something to explore there. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by the word probably? If I say, you know, it's probably they're going to rain soon. Uh, what I'm really saying is is something, you know, I don't know what I'm saying. I need to I want to, you know, there is this idea of probability. There is this idea of chance. And in order to use it, in order to harness that, in order to build on it, we have to do some math. So that's another one of these informal concepts. Probability, we can talk about it, but we need to also develop it. Another one uh, is, is value. Value is a, a very cool one, I think. Um, so like, you know, for example, Karl Marx, Adam Smith, and David Ricardo, these three uh, economic, early economic thinkers uh, wanted to understand uh, the uh, you know, the idea of, of an economy in the abstract. And so they came up with this notion of value. Um, which helps you understand society and human labor. Um, you know, so so value theory is another one of these informal kind of abstract concepts. Another one is computation, and we'll talk about computation in just a minute. But the, this is what I mean by an informal concept. Start with something. Maybe, maybe you know, geometry is another one. But if we have this informal, abstract, but nonetheless kind of concrete e existing concept that we want to understand better. Hopefully, that makes some sense. Uh, step two is uh, we want to attempt to capture these uh, oops, these informal concepts with a formal definition. And what I mean by formal definition is, you know, i.e. identify um, key salient properties of the thing, of the informal concept, and express them in the abstract. Whoops. So that's a bit, that's a bit uh, difficult to, you know, the, the, what, I'm, what I'm explaining right now is very high level, and, and I don't want people to worry too much about understanding all of it. Um, but I do want to lay it out so that it's kind of in the back of people's heads. We're going to expand greatly on this because computability theory is deeply connected to just kind of the concept of doing what I'm doing at all. It's, it's really deeply connected to logic, 
and logic is really deeply connected to kind of a it's a logic is a field and computability theory because we're going to see that they're sort of mirror images of each other um is uh very meta you'll 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 get confused at times like am i talking about math or am i doing math and the answer is yes you know um we're going to see that as we go um but right now i just want to kind of frame the discussion by kind of thinking in general about what the process of math is and also sort of what the process of 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 science is i think um so there's something i want to understand better some informal con con concept probability let's say let's just pick probability um, and what I want to do is I want to capture this with a formal definition. And what I mean by that is there are some basic things that I already know are true about probability. You know, for example, it's a, uh, it's a function. It's a function that takes events, that is things that I'm thinking about maybe happening in real life, the event of a coin flip landing heads, the event of, the of me winning the lottery. This is an event. And each of those things has a number associated with it that kind of measures how confident I am that the thing is going to happen. So these are some very basic aspects of what a probability is. It's a function that takes events to numbers. Those numbers are going to be between zero and one. If I have an event that involves another event, like for example, you know, if if the if a coin lands heads, this is going to be stupid. If a coin lands heads, heads, then it landed, right? So if I already so so in other words, the the probability that it lands heads should be smaller than the probability that it lands is kind of the point. So you've got this kind of idea of containment. These are basic properties that you start with. And we want to write those down in the abstract. That's in kind of a mathematical formalism. And from that, what we can do is, um, well, let's think about what we can do. So basically, I've identified some concepts. And, and by the way, these um, properties have a name. They're called axioms. I'll just put it, I don't know how to underline, so I'm just going to write it in caps. These properties are called axioms. Um, so if I have a list of axioms, then what I have after that is uh, what I can do is I can, I can explore in a rigorous way based on those truths. But let's think about that. If I, if I write down some basic properties that I think a probability has, and then I start to prove other things from those properties, because if I have that A, B, and C are true, then there's a whole there's a whole list there's a whole infinite so list of other things that are true, formally and logically just following from those things. I get a whole theory, and those that theory is connected to the in, to the informal concept I wanted. Um, so, let me write down the next thing. I, I, um, this over. So, these probably. Uh, won't fully capture uh, all of the intricacies. I don't know how to spell intricacies uh, of of your concept, right? So I'm I'm I you know, let, maybe let's think about quantity. Let's think about the natural numbers. What are some properties that are super basic about the natural numbers? Well, uh, you know, there's always least element. You've got this this concept of the number one. You've got this concept of succession. I can add one and get to another thing. There's this. There's commutativity. Maybe you want that as an axiom. But there are these properties, and I can write down seven or eight of them, and I can prove things from those seven and eight, seven or eight axioms. But the whole list of things that I prove from that probably won't be extensive. It probably won't completely tell me everything in existence about the natural numbers. Um, so that's what I mean by these. Probably won't capture all of the intricacies of your concept that you're trying to explore. Um, and, and, and we're going to explore what this means. Again, if you're, if you're having trouble following, don't worry about it. Maybe even skip this part. I don't know. Um, this is just kind of where I wanted to start. Um, you know, the, you know there, you might have heard of this before, Gödel's completeness, Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Uh, basically confirms that it doesn't capture the full intricacies depending on the concept. So uh, I'm going to say Gödel's incompleteness theorem confirms this and uh, identifies sufficient conditions um, such that such that this this inadequacy of your axioms is is guaranteed. Um, and we'll prove that as, as we go through this confirms this and identifies sufficient conditions such that this is the case. So I've written down some axioms trying to understand this thing, this kind of 
it's not physical, it's abstract, but it's there. It's in this kind of platonic realm of ideas. The natural numbers were there before I started talking about them. I'm just trying to understand them better, right? And so I can write down some axioms that try to capture the natural numbers, but um, that won't be good enough. But it will. But that's not to say that it isn't a, a, a pointless endeavor, um, because you know, if I write down some axioms and I prove some things that are true, well, then what do I know? What I know then is that anything, any concept such that these axioms are true in that concept, in that model, uh, then I've, I, I've found truth within there. I haven't found all the truth, but any truths that I derive about the natural numbers from these axioms, uh, you know, uh, would be uh, truths about those things. So basically what I'm gonna say is uh, what we get, oops, what we get is a theory, I'll put that in caps too. What I mean by theory is really just, it, it's a set. It's the set of all true statements uh, from those axioms. What we get is a theory, um, and, you know, a set of provable formal truths. Um, that, that is to say facts, uh, which will remain true for anything satisfying my axioms, including the natural numbers. Right, so if I write down some axioms for probability, and then I prove some things from those axioms, then regardless of what, you know, regardless of whether the axioms I wrote down fully capture all of the intricacies and, 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 and craziness about a, what probability is, I've still proven something within probability theory, assuming that probability as an instance does satisfy those axioms. Um, and we're gonna, like I said, again, I've said this three times already, but we're gonna come back to all of what I'm writing down. We're gonna, we're gonna mathematize these three steps that I've written. Well, not really three steps. This is sort of not a step. This is kind of a, I wonder if I can, I think I can do this. Whoops, other way. Um, can I move around? Whoops, no. Yeah, okay, there we go, cool. Um, and I can move this over here because it's sort of a side thing. So this is step two. So step one was identify a formal concept that you want to better understand. Step two is try to capture that informal concept with an informal definition. And then step three is uh, from those axioms, uh, prove things formally. Ah. Prove things formally. Uh, then assuming your axioms were true statements, uh, you have discovered uh, with a bit of thought, you can, you can connect back that formal thing, those formal, sta those formal uh, statements that you've proven Uh, have uh, con have kind of meaning in, in informal meaning. So I can prove things in this very math in this very mechanical kind of robotic way. Proofs, in a sense, are extremely robotic, um, and we're and, and we're going to talk about that. That's this is the this is the connection between computability theory and logic and proving things because, in a sense, I can have a computer prove everything there is to prove. I can't. It would take forever, but I can do it. And so proofs, formal proofs from a set of axioms are mechanical. It's a mechanical process. Math, as, math itself and science is a mechanical process in that sense. But, uh, you know, there's a step, there's another step, which is, okay, I've proven this kind of abstract set of statements because, you know, we're going to have a lot of math symbols floating around, right? We're going to have a bunch of, you know, Greek letters and stuff. And then I'm going to have to ask myself, okay, I proved this weird thing symbolic statement with with words that I've defined and symbols and all sorts of weird things. And now I have to kind of take that and say, okay, well, what does this actually mean informally? What have I said about the informal concept that I've started with? So that's kind of what I mean. It's this kind of, it's this descent. 
Um, so, and, and that's an important step. So just to summarize, so we, start with a, we start with an informal concept. We capture that concept with a formal definition. We prove things from that definition. And then we think about those things we've proven and derive informal meaning. We've, we've, uh, have inform you have discovered truth. Uh, which you could not have otherwise, which would have otherwise been very hard to come by, which would have otherwise been very hard or maybe impossible to discern yourself. So that this is what math is to me. This is what math is to me. And, and in some sense, I think this is what science is. Uh, but it's worth talking about. Now, what I'm going to do now is when I edit this video, um, I want to... I want to quote. I want to play a clip from uh, one of David Harvey's lectures on, on on Karl Marx's book Capital. I'm going to play this clip because in this clip Marx is talking about uh, his process of what he's doing when he's when he's writing that book Capital. Capital is a very crazy book, um, and and that's going to connect back to kind of what I'm saying here. So I'm going to play that and then I'm going to say some stuff. The method of presentation must differ in form from that of inquiry. The latter, that is the process of inquiry, has to appropriate the material in detail to analyze its different forms of development and to track down their inner connection. Only after this work has been done can the real movement be appropriately presented. If this is done successfully, if the life of the subject matter, that is a capitalist mode of production, is now reflected back in the ideas, then it may appear as if we have before us an a priori construction. What Marx is talking about here is his method of inquiry is different from his method of presentation. His method of inquiry starts with everything that exists, everything that's going on. You start with reality as you experience it, as you see it, as you feel it. You start with all of that. You start with descriptions of the reality, by the political economists, by novelists, by everybody. You start with all that material. And then you search in that material with, for some simple concepts. This is what he calls the method of descent. The method of descent from the reality which you find going down, looking for some foundational, fundamental concepts. And once you've uncovered and discovered those fundamental concepts, you then come back to the surface. And you look at what's going on around in the surface and you see that behind the world of appearance that you started out with, there is another way to interpret what's going on. So if that sounded a lot like what I've been describing, then that is, that is sort of the point. Now it's interesting because Marx is not at all talking about what I'm talking about. He's not doing that. Um, but he is trying to discover abstract truths. He's trying to study capitalism in the abstract. Uh, and to do that, he had to do essentially kind of what every scientist does, which is start with something that you're observing in material reality. Um, the only difference in math is that we're observing something in the platonic realm of reality, uh, abstraction, but it's still kind of there, right? Capitalism, what is it? You know, it's a word humans made up, but it's also a real thing, the material thing. Same thing with quantity, probability, value. All of these are abstract concepts that have, that we understand material exists, materially exists, but to understand them better, we have to kind of do this, what Mark, what David Harvey calls this, this, this method of descent, I think. Um, um, and, and that's kind of, that's what, that's what math, that's what mathematicians do. They, they find something abstract. Actually, I don't want to do that. Um, So let me let me just summarize kind of the connection between what he's doing and what I'm doing. So it really all it, it really all comes down to this. Um, we start with the informal. We want to understand it, and then what we do is we we descend and try to formalize what, what I'm talking about, and then from that we return to the informal, and we keep repeating this process sort of. This is maybe this is sort of how I think about it, um, 
and and I think it's kind of what I think the way David Harvey explains it is he's, he's, he almost makes it sound like you're a diver, like you're diving underwater to grab truth. And, and, and I very much think that that's the case. But as he notes, the method of, and, th and this is a really crucial thing for mathematics is that the method of descent, the method of inquiry is not at all the same as the method of presentation. David Harvey says that very clearly, and I, and I think he's right. And this is where people get stuck. This is where people have trouble teaching math is because the presentation does seem um, like an a priori construction. They're giving you these definitions, they're giving you this theory, and they just kind of expect you to be able to derive the important meaning where you might not even understand what they're gonna be talking about to begin with. And that's, that's a tightrope that you have to walk um, as a math teacher. Um, so basically what I'm gonna be doing in this series of videos is I'm going to be defining all sorts of weird math concepts. and I'm going to try to justify them, but the, the order that we're going to be doing things, we start with the definition, which is down here. This it's the second step, right? Um, this step, this we're starting with step two, not step one. So the way that we teach a math class, we're sort of in the, we, we sort of start in the middle. Um, and you have to figure out as you go through the class, how, you know, how they thought of that, you know, you'll always think that you always kind of have that question when you're when you're learning that. How did they think of that? How did they get to this? Well, it's because they started here and not here. Um, but the presentation when you're presenting math almost kind of has to start here. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna try very hard to start here as much as possible. Um, but I think there's a lot to be said. I mean, David Harvey's talking about like science maybe a little more than math when he's doing that quote. But I also think he's saying something very important about mathematics and the difference between being a mathematician and presenting a theory of math. Um, I think that's also, I think that applies just as well here. So um, that's some philosophy of math. That's some, that's some philosophy of science. Um, now let's actually talk about uh, computability theory as a whole. Yeah, cool. Um, so let's talk about computability theory. What is it? What is uh, computability theory? Well, it's the theory of computation. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means a lot of things. It, it you know, what is a computer? You know, what, well, that's not a good one. 